Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forum's webinar and podcast series, Israel Insider with Ashley Perry. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Mr. Ashley Perry, advisor to the Middle East Forum's Israel office, join us here each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to update us on all the events going on in Israel. Mr. Perry will be giving us a briefing on current Israeli affairs for 15 minutes, then open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Now, with no further ado, I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Ashley Perry. Thank you very much, Stacey, and good evening from Israel. Um, after the dramatic events of uh, last week, again, not wholly unexpected, but uh, you know, we had a dispersal of Knesset, we had a change of uh, prime minister, uh, we had a now former prime minister who has decided to resign, at least temporarily, from public office. As I said last week, I do believe that Naftali Bennett will return at some point in the future. But for now, he's uh, not uh, running in the uh, next elections. Uh, and uh, the passing of the leadership of the Yamina party to Ayelet Shaked. So this week has been far less dramatic, let's say. Uh, most of um, you know politics is sort of be uh, taking place behind the scenes. All the parties will be uh, looking to fill campaign staff. Will be looking for campaign managers, directors, communications people, online experts, gurus, all that sort of stuff. Trawling for possible messaging. Trawling for opposition research. What what's the best message? Um, and who's the best to attack, what are the issues, if there are any. Um, as I suggested in previous weeks, I don't think these uh, elections, unfortunately, like uh, the last couple of years, will be uh, mostly about policy, it'll be mostly, uh, di- you know, sort of divisive messages about who, you know, I'll stand up to that person, or that person is a danger, and if you vote for them, uh, then state of Israel is going to crumble, et cetera, et cetera. These are the sort of messages I believe we're going to hear. Um, But I'm sure all the parties um, are polling, polling regularly, testing the messages, testing to see what their base um, uh, will most motivate their base and then see which party they could possibly take votes for. Uh, What we uh, are hearing, and it makes a certain amount of sense, is Netanyahu, as I said last week, uh, Netanyahu, it certainly was a good week for him, uh, the fact that the government fell and that Naftali Bennett uh, is not running the elections and the party went over to Ayelet Shaked, who is far more likely uh, to sit in Netanyahu government. In fact, uh, she was, uh, as Gidon Saar came out uh, very openly this week, she was uh, negotiated to try and form an alternative government and was uh, trying to call Saar and some of his party members to go across to the opposition to form an alternate government without going to elections. So certainly Netanyahu will be, uh, you know, last week was in a better place. Uh, this week, um, there's been a few blows uh, to the Netanyahu camp, uh, and I'll just take you through uh, some of them. First of all, uh, as I said, uh, it's he, he seems to be indicating, or it seems to be uh, that he will target uh, SARS voters and uh, of the New Hope Party and Yamina voters, those sort of right of center who perhaps, you know, d- uh, voted for them, perhaps they didn't like BB, perhaps whatever, whatever the reasons were, he's trying to rope them back in. And part of that uh, process is trying to appeal to, you know, what, what's called the sort of more moderate right. Uh, and to do this, um, he's going to try and, and the message has been sent out to try and silence the more, let's say, quote unquote, loud mouth uh, members of the party. There's a certain uh, cadre in the Likud who in recent years have become known in certain parts of the political map for opening their mouths. Uh, only in the last few days, uh, we've had um, Ayub Kari, who's actually not a member of Knesset, but as a f- former minister for the Likud, a Jews uh, member of Knesset, who said that uh, we will I can't remember exactly the word to use, but we will basically punish the left when we return to power. I think it was even more harsh language than that. And then you had um, Yoav Kish, uh, who came out and said that uh, if Benny Gantz, we talked about this last week, if if the um, if the sort of judicial system allows um, uh, Benny Gantz to appoint a chief of staff before the elections, we will have to replace it, uh, which caused quite a lot of. Uh, 
uh, outrage. And there's been uh, various other um, comments that have sort of, you know, gathered attention because of their, you know, supposed extremism. It seems like uh, Netanyahu wants to rein that in, wants to play up uh, the more moderate, what's called in Israel, Mamlachti, sort of, you know, uh, uh, those uh, members of Knesset, former ministers who are seen as more moderate, seen as more, you know, upstanding. Uh, and we've certainly seen that, uh, uh, you know, I always say uh, to people, if you want to understand where Netanyahu's head is, understand who's going to represent the Likud party or, or you know, the opposition in the media. And we've seen a lot of Tzachi Negbi. Tzachi Negbi, first of all, is on the left wing of the Likud party. He is seen as a moderate member. He is seen as not someone who's necessarily going to put his foot in it and not going to make comments. And he's not seen as overly divisive. So the fact that he's been sent up quite a lot over the last week uh, in the media, I think also plays into that uh, narrative that Netanyahu has tried to silence those voices. Uh, today, it appears it was released, I'm sure it was leaked, that there are apparently 20,000 uh, 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 Likud new members who have, who have joined in the last year, uh, mostly by some of uh, these members of Knesset, which are more peripheral, but certainly uh, have been quite loud over the last year. Uh, people like uh, Shlomo Kari, uh, and uh, Aritel Distan, I think that was her name, who are basically considered not the most moderate, in fact, certainly on the more right-wing uh, wings of the party. Apparently, they're the ones who signed up these 20,000. And uh, according to Likud bylaws, that, as we know, there's going to be primaries later in the year. Uh, and while at the moment no one's challenging Netanyahu, what is important is who gets placed where on the list. And uh, now uh, the people that I've mentioned are largely backbenchers, um, and uh, Distan herself was actually put on the list without having to run last time. Uh, Netanyahu had, a, I believe, the two secured seats that he wanted to bring in, so he brought her in. Um, and so she didn't really necessarily have a base, so she's managed to bring in a certain amount of people. But according to Likud bylaws, uh, you have to have 16 months uh, in the party before you can vote in the primaries. Um, but apparently Netanyahu, uh, in his role as chairman of the party, can... Uh, waive that and allow them to vote. Uh, at the, they say at the moment Netanyahu has no interest in doing so because he's tried to play out the more moderate members. Um, uh, so it depends how this how this will play out. If he does let those 20,000 in, that could tell you a lot about where he's going. If he doesn't, that will also uh, be a bit of an indication. Um, another thing that could hurt him, although it's very, very early, is the start of the court case, what's known as Case 1000. Case 1000 follows on from Case 4000, which was certainly most serious. But Case 1000, in many ways, while it is less um, serious, it doesn't involve uh, bribery, it involves bre uh, breach of trust. Uh, according to the first witness, at least, who is, a, who, uh, is a, 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 an assistant to uh, multi-millionaires who have become very close to Netanyahu's in previous years. Uh, the accusation is that uh, uh, Netanyahu and his wife uh, were basically bought gifts um, totaling hundreds of thousands of shekels, usually cigars, champagnes, uh, and jewelry. Uh, and as a, a, an elected official, uh, you're not allowed to accept uh, gifts over a couple of hundred shekels uh, at a time. Um, and it appears that this was a regular daily, weekly thing that these, um, not only were these millionaires buying uh, gifts for the Netanyahu, it was actually, according to the, the witness, uh, it was actually the Netanyahu who were making these demands, knowing, again, according to the witness, um, that it was illegal, uh, but they did it anyway. Uh, and she talked about some of the scenes which, again, have been played out uh, in Israel in the media, which are quite outstanding, what lengths uh, were gone to in the middle of the night, calling for a certain brand of cigars that could only be bought from Cuba for uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, things like that. And uh, what the, the prosecution needs to show is the uh, quid pro quo. And one of them was to ensure that uh, one of the Israeli businessmen, or one is an Israeli businessman, the other is an Australian businessman, the Israeli businessman got a 10-year visa. Um, and Netanyahu, again, according to this testimony, uh, went to such lengths that he involved then uh, Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh, so that would be considered the quid pro quo. Uh, so that's, again, you know, there are those who say there's a long way to go. 
we're going to have a break uh, of a couple of months over the summer recess. Uh, the court case will take its time. Uh, and we shouldn't forget that at the moment it's the prosecution's turn to, uh, to talk to witnesses. In fact, the witness is a prosecution witness. And as in uh, Netanyahu's team are uh, basically putting up the narrative that uh, as in case 4000, his defense team is, will be able to pick holes in this testimony. Um, so that remains to be seen whether that's going to hurt him. But certainly the picture that has been uh, painted in a courtroom is of a couple uh, that were given, uh, you know, very expensive had a, uh, gifts, a lavish private lifestyle paid by outside people who then uh, had favors returned to them. Uh, so that certainly hasn't played very well into his image. Another very interesting snippet we've heard throughout the last year, uh, whenever the accusation has come from Netanyahu, especially in his block in general, that this part, this government has relied on the Ram Party, the Islamist uh, uh, party, uh, you know, uh, for its survival. And on many occasions, Mansour Abbas, the leader of the Ram Party, has not, lo not lost an opportunity to stand up and say to Netanyahu, to his face and other Likud members, you're the ones who negotiated with me first. You offered me this and that. You offered me no less than this government. Uh, so you're being a hypocrite. Well, this week we saw the first uh, snippet of evidence of that, where released recordings or, and letters, Mansour Abbas apparently, uh, when these negotiations with Likud ostensibly were going on, uh, there was resistance from the religious Zionist uh, party and movement in general. And so there was a meeting arranged by uh, then Likud, uh, MK Amit Alevi, uh, between Mansour Abbas and uh, Rav, Rabbi Chaim Drukman. Now, Ch Rav Chaim Drukman, is a very important player in the religious Zionist, especially the right-wing religious um, uh, community, the, the so-called Chadal, the Haredi Lomi, the, um, the, the more, let's say, the, 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 the wing of the religious Zionist movement that is closer to the ultra-Orthodox. Um, so a blessing from him or the green light from him would have been very important. Apparently, they did meet and things were going towards uh, Jukman uh, endorsing Mansour Abbas uh, uh, if not entering the government, at least voting with the government and the government of Netanyahu, that would have been with, with his 59 at the time, uh, would have relied uh, on, uh, on uh, Mansour Abbas. And apparently things were going well. There was even a few tests. If he, if he condemned a terrorist uh, attack, which he did, um, and at the time he was asked if he would endorse Israel as a Jewish homeland, he said he can't at that point. Uh, so then it was also at least endorsed as a Jewish and democratic state, which he eventually did uh, over the last year. Apparently, things were going very well to the point where other rabbis were invited to, uh, to join uh, Rabbi Drukman in this sort of blessing of, uh, of the right wing government relying on Ram. Uh, but apparently, Betzal Smotrich and one of his uh, uh, other members of Knesset, well, uh, yeah, member of Knesset, Orit Struk. Uh, heard about this meeting and entered, and apparently, according to some of the participants, didn't let anyone else have a word and shouted and basically got his way. And that was the end of that deal and the end of a possibility of uh, a Netanyahu-led right-wing government relying on Ram. Uh, but what it does show is that there were very serious negotiations. If it got to the point where Mansour Abbas was meeting with such a senior figure in the religious Zionist community, uh, as Rav Druckmann, it, it, it's clear what, what that would have led to. So perhaps it's taken the sheen to a certain extent off those uh, denials by Netanyahu. They're still trying to deny it. Smotrich himself is not denying it and claiming that he was the one who stopped it. So, you know, even giving a little bit of a credibility to the story or added credibility to the story. So perhaps that is something that will come up again and again as Netanyahu tries to make the case, uh, as he already has done consistently, that. Uh, that uh, you know, this government was a failure because it had to rely on the Islamist movement. Uh, finally, another sort of uh, relatively, what should have been a relatively minor event, Moshe Gaffney, the leader of the United Torah Judaism, I believe it was, his, it was either his daughter or granddaughter had a wedding this week. And you would think these things wouldn't be such a big deal. He invited many of his colleagues um, uh, in politics from across the spectrum. And what made the biggest news was uh, Labour Party uh, leader Merov Michaeli dancing in the women's section uh, with the bride. Uh, he certainly got a lot of 
flack for that uh, within the Haredi society. Uh, there was also members of Yeshatid there, Benny Gantz was uh, one of the honored guests, and of course, obviously Netanyahu was there. But again, it plays into that feeling that Gafni, as I've spoken about, he is key. Uh, if Netanyahu isn't able to form his government, if he isn't able to get his 61, I've always uh, stated that Moshe Gafni is one of the players who could bring Netanyahu down, uh, more so probably than any member that he could at this point. So the fact that he was there and invited all these you know, people from across the aisle, uh, members of Knesset ministers that are sitting in the current government, just gives another little hint out there that Netanyahu is not the only gay uh, name of the game. Uh, finally, a poll was put out. In fact, there were a number of polls because it's such an important uh, area to see where the uh, ultra-Orthodox public is on Netanyahu. And the question was raised, if Netanyahu isn't able to form a government, uh, should, they, should the ultra-Orthodox party still stay loyal to him? And again, there is that split between the Ashkenazi, you know, to Torah Judaism, which is split up between the Lithuanian and the Hasidic part, uh, which is, is, is less hawkish on security issues, which is less beholden uh, to Netanyahu. And the majority said that they should look for other options, whereas the Shas party, which is traditionally a lot of their voters are outside the ultra-Orthodox community, much more right-wing and much more uh, loyal to Netanyahu. But the fact is that the overall numbers showed that the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox public, believes that if Netanyahu isn't able to form a government after the next elections, they should explore. And that's very important, the wording. It didn't say that he should necessarily go, but it said he should certainly, that they, they should certainly explore forming a government uh, without Netanyahu. So um, none of these are, you know, Netanyahu will certainly be uh, pleased over the last couple of weeks of what's happened. But certainly this week, there, there were a few hits. Um, but uh, the polls there remaining steady, uh, and uh, a lot will depend, as we've said in the past, on where Yamina goes, if it goes, if it passes the threshold. Um, but certainly this week, Netanyahu took uh, a few light knocks. Uh, we'll see how many of them have got any sort of sustainability until the real uh, campaign starts in earnest, probably after the, the Jewish holidays in September, October. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you so much. Before we get into all that, uh, we have a few, a few questions on Russia from our audience. Uh, Jacob Hirschman asks, can Mr. Perry comment on the allegations that Russia has stated Israel can no longer attack Iranian military assets in Syria? Well, this has been coming for a while. It, it's, I mean, it's not necessarily they, they enunciated where they can't attack, but they came out that you know Israel is acting illegally. There's a certain amount of irony. You can suggest that uh, Russia at this time is is saying that it's illegal to uh, to uh, you know impinge on the sovereignty of another nation. Uh, so certainly the language they've used uh, and the immediacy of it after actually an Israeli attack that took place during the day and apparently was near a Russian installation. No Russians were injured and no, no Russian property or assets were, 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 were destroyed, but it was close enough, perhaps the fact that it was during the day, perhaps also the fact that the Russians are getting more and more annoyed uh, with Israel because Israel is getting more and more close to the Ukrainian position, um, that uh, perhaps it's even because Lapid, who, is, who as we spoke about a few months ago, was playing the sort of, you know, they're playing good cop, bad cop, and uh, Bennett, you know, was trying to be the mediator, trying to be more moderate in his tone towards Russia, whereas now current Prime Minister Lapid <clears throat> was far more open uh, with his comments in condemnation of Russia. Perhaps that's also part of it in there. But the fact is that the patience of the Russians are wearing thin, uh, but Israel is continuing to uh, do what it deems necessary uh, in Syria, especially when it's uh, regarding Iranian and Hezbollah targets. Speaking of Hezbollah, Eric asks, what do you think is the significance of the drones coming into Israel from Hezbollah? Well, they weren't coming into Israel. They were uh, going over Israel territorial waters. I mean, that goes into the whole disagreement Israel has with, uh, with Lebanon in general, and Hezbollah in particular, although Hezbollah have tried to take publicly a more moderate line. But it's clear that uh, you know there, there is an attempt to try and harm the offshore drilling that Israel is doing in what it considers uh, its uh, waters. 
which the Lebanese contest. Uh, the Americans are trying to mediate. And the fact is uh, Prime Minister Lapid was in France meeting with President Macron. And we know that France has a very historic role in Lebanon. So I'm sure that issue was, uh, in fact, I think it was even mentioned in the readout that that, that issue was uh, certainly uh, prominent uh, in those talks. Uh, so it is significant. It shows you know, a, a heightening of tensions surrounding Israel's drilling in that particular uh, part. And apparently this wasn't the first attack. It now uh, comes out that this was actually the second drone attack. So uh, Israel, uh, as I said, has responded um, in the Kunetra region. And we'll see if, if, uh, if there's any further attacks from, uh, from now. Thank you. And one more before we get into the Israeli politics nitty gritty. Uh, Kerry Hillebrand asks, why did Aliyah from the Ukraine and possibly also Russia not meet initial predictions and apparently almost fizzled out? Is there any truth to the speculation that Israel either by design or by an aptitude, an aptitude choked off the stream of migrants, immigrants? I don't think so. I think, first of all, what, uh, what the government did was not necessarily say this is how many people will make aliyah is this how many, this is how many people could make aliyah we need to have the infrastructure in place if the highest estimations uh, took place so i'm not sure if uh, it certainly were record numbers uh, of immigrants from from the ukraine and i believe russia as well russia it's certainly harder to make aliyah from at the moment first of all because a lot of planes uh, are not traveling to russia so even if people have been given the green light to make aliyah from russia at the moment they're finding it hard uh, to actually even leave Russia, and now apparently there's a bit of a debate. Have the Jewish has the Jewish agency, which is a vital piece in the story of those who want to make Aliyah anywhere in the world outside of the uh, the US, has now been asked to cease uh, operations in Russia. Uh, it's not clear exactly to what extent uh, and what that means, but it certainly will uh, create uh, um, you know uh, difficulties for those who want to make Aliyah from Russia. Thank you so much. And uh, Jose asks, from my faraway point of view, it looks to me that there is a personality problem. Do you believe that Israel politics and forming a government will be easier without Netanyahu being part of the game? Quite simply, almost certainly, yes. Um, that I mean, that is that is the case that's been made by many people. Uh, I'll just tell uh, Yuli Edelstein for one. Yuli Edelstein, who uh, came second in the last Likud primary, so a very popular politician, and up until recently was expected to challenge Netanyahu in the primaries, uh, Likud primaries later in the year. He's since decided to drop out, claiming uh, it's a case of unity. Uh, probably the reason is, is because if Netanyahu is taken, uh, uh, you know, is removed as leader, you don't want to be that person who caused that because there'll be a certain amount of backlash. So perhaps that's the reason. But anyway, but what he did say, he made the case when he was trying to make the case for himself, and I think there's a certain amount of legitimacy to it, is Netanyahu will always get the most votes in any election of any liquid leader, but he's less likely to be able to form a government. And the fact is that uh, if Netanyahu had not been uh, leader of the Likud over the last year, we would, have, we would not have seen this government. There would have been a right-wing religious government, almost certainly, uh, from the beginning. People like Gidon Saar, Naftali Bennett, uh, Eilat Shaked um, have no problem uh, sitting with the Likud. They have a problem sitting with Netanyahu. Someone like Avigdor Liebman, also part of the right-wing bloc, certainly with his views, uh, also has a problem with the ultra-Orthodox parties, but has said many times, especially in the last couple of days, that he is not against the Likud. He feels he can work and cooperate with the Likud, but he will not sit uh, another moment in the government uh, with Netanyahu. So I think when you have all these people saying it consistently, then absolutely it does come down to uh, a personality issue that these people have with Netanyahu, not with Likud itself. Thank you. And Larry Greenberg follows up on that. If George Washington or David Ben-Gurion were not indispensable, can Netanyahu see himself as an elder statesman and anoint a successor? Well, we haven't seen any of it so far. Um, he, the only time he's ever talked about a successor was uh, Yossi Cohen, the, the former head of the Mossad. He said that he could see him as a, a successor, but he's not entering politics, at least not at the moment. Uh, there's no one currently in the Likud uh, party who is seen as a successor, certainly no one close enough to Netanyahu 
to be seen as a successor. As I've said, those who usually go to bat for him in the media are usually backbenchers, uh, not necessarily those, you know, the powerhouses in the Likud. The people like uh, Yisrael Katz, Yuli Edelstein, certainly Nir Barkat, uh, and a few others like that, those are the powerhouses in the Likud. But uh, none of them have any great love for Netanyahu. They will all go out and claim during the primaries that they are the closest thing to Netanyahu. But certainly there's no love loss between, for example, uh, Netanyahu and Barkat. Barkat was promised to be finance minister a couple of governments ago. And then that position was given to Yisrael Katz. Yisrael Katz was, doesn't like Barkat. And uh, Edelstein is not liked by this one, by that one. And there has been... You can argue whether it's intentional or not. I would say for such a seasoned politician like Netanyahu, it's probably more than uh, more than likely intentional. There has been a divide and conquer because there is no one particular leader. There's been no successor uh, in place. And when there's no successor in place, it's harder to believe that the incumbent is going anywhere. If there is a designated successor, then that person you know, can become a rallying point uh, to defeat the incumbent, but because there isn't one, there's no lightning rod there. Uh, so, uh, and, and the Likud have a bit of a history with that. They've never replaced a sitting Likud leader. If you look at it, and they've only had, what, about five or six leaders in, in the history of the party. Um, so it's, uh, it's certainly not going to happen before these elections. And again, I, I stress it's my personal belief that the, uh, the removal of Netanyahu will not happen within the Likud or it's less likely to happen in Likud, it will probably happen. Uh, some of his partners and the most likely to desert him uh, is the United Torah Judaism Party led by Moshe Gaffney. Thank you. And you did mention that Netanyahu is looking to, to target the moderate right. Uh, Alvin Koras asks, uh, does it appear that the Israeli public is moving from center right closer to the traditional right, giving more votes and MKs to Likud and Yamina? I mean, for, I mean, that that's that's the problem with Israeli politics. What is these terms left and right? Um, I wouldn't say they have no meaning because they still do. But the issues which divided the political spectrum, the Palestinian issue, is pretty non-existent. Uh, hasn't been uh, prominent in I don't know how many elections. I can't remember the last time that Palestinian issue was prominent. So. These, these terms are banded around. I'm a left wing, that guy's right wing, this guy's right. Certainly that's probably, you know, that there's a certain truth to it, but certainly the positions uh, are not on those traditional, uh, uh, you know, where you stand on the Palestinian state, where you stand on, you know, territorial, uh, the territories, Judea and uh, Samaria, the West Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Those issues barely come up. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, at the political level, uh, the elites, it's, it's not a standing issue. But yes, the Israeli public has certainly moved away uh, from this uh, belief that perhaps there was in the early 90s that a, a, Palestinian, a Palestinian state, if not welcome, at least was probably the better, in you know, a better way to end the conflict. Uh, most people do not believe the conflict is going to end. They don't believe that there's a partner on the other side. Uh, so yes, they probably moved uh, over to the right. There's also, interestingly, perhaps in contradistinction to many other Western countries, uh, the younger you are, the more right-wing you are. Um, in the US, for example, it's usually the opposite. Uh, but in Israel, you know, the, usually those who, who are voting for the first time tend to, tend to veer right, sometimes even far right. So that certainly gives a boost to those parties. Um, and yes, the positions, you know, the, the so-called centrists of Lapid and Gantz are not talking about Palestinian state, yes, Lapid will say uh, with President Macron that uh, he supports a two-state solution, but then he also says that there's no political diplomatic horizon and there's no scheduled meetings for any for, uh, for, uh, for with Abbas at, at any point in the future, and he's certainly not going to uh, spend too much political or diplomatic capital trying to go down that route. So the only real people who may have an agenda on, on that issue is probably on the extremes, on the extreme left and the extreme right. Uh, but again, I think these elections will be far more about sort of divisions, about who you dislike less, perhaps, if I put it that way, uh, and less really about when it comes down to it about uh, policy and political issues. So I know we're running out of time, but Stephen Orlo asks uh, real quick, what is the general view among the political class regarding Lipid's ability to handle the prime ministership? 
well, the political class, that's quite a wide. If you're, if you're in the opposition, then you're going to think he has zero credibility. And certainly that's the case that's being made constantly. Uh, but if you're on the, uh, you know, if you're in the government block, uh, as it is, you know, they, they see uh, no problem with him. They see him as a worthy prime minister, uh, you know, perhaps electorally more worthy than Naftali Bennett, who had, uh, I think, six or seven seats. Um, uh, Lapid has, I think, 17 or 18 seats. So you could argue he has far more legitimacy to be prime minister. But also, let's not forget, he is an interim prime minister. He is a prime minister, you know, in, 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 in everything. But uh, this government, as all governments, when once the Knesset has been dispersed, is very limited. It has its hands tied. It can't take extremely large decisions, uh, unless, of course, they're emergency decisions. So I don't think that we will see too much um, in the next, what is it, six months by Prime Minister Lapid that will be markedly different. Again, his positions uh, on many of the issues will be relatively similar to uh, Naftali Bennett's, also because, quite simply, he's still got the same government. Obviously, it won't be as constrained now because the government is dispersed. You don't need to keep everyone in line. But I don't think there'll be too many dramatic moves on the economy, on diplomacy, on security, uh, as before. And on the security issue, we're seeing still day after day, the IDF are in uh, uh, Palestinian towns and villages, weeding out the terrorist organizations, weeding out terrorists who are looking to uh, commit attacks. And I saw a statistic today, I think something like in the last couple of weeks, 172 suicide uh, and other type of terrorist attacks have been avoided because the IDF is taking extremely robust measures, uh, perhaps the likes of which we haven't seen since Operation uh, Defensive Shield in the early 2000s. Um, and so this is carrying on under Lapid. So again, I don't see too much uh, changing uh, in the policy realm in the next six months. Great. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar and podcast. Ashley, thank you again for taking time to update us this week. Thank you. For our viewers and listeners, please join us at Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern for a webinar with Dexter Van Zyl uh, discussing bad germ journalism fuels Western Islamism. Uh, thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day.